It's it flipped Jerry when it's more of a thing. Yeah, I came in with whatever I was doing. <laughs> she was like, oh, I took a shower and then I went I mean, into work. Uh, and I'm like, what? Crazy about it, I was, She's like, well, so I forgot I had some receipts that I had to take Where is this image? No. Who cares? So this image is on the computer. They will go on. I promise you that this is going to fall apart. Or no, below. Maybe that was reasonable regulations to me. So then when it's time, he's going to everything in town. We've got Tom and Bob and my friend in the TV room. Oh, she complains no, about it. Oh, I was going to say, I'm in a group. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, exactly. I already told her yeah, to expect this. They really embraced it. Yeah, exactly. I had two people in the car, and I got cool. Yeah. 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 I had a meeting with Bloomville. That's what I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. And it was, I mean, before it clicked over, everything was working perfectly fast. So we should be able to. She had to come home all day. She went to work at 8 a.m. and she went home at 8 30. That's a meeting. What are you doing? Yeah. I, had to get the, I had to get the newsletter out. There's none of these 80 year olds that should not be driving their cars. Speaking of the eclipse stuff, I'm deeply excited about that. I don't know what you need help with. Let me know. I'd love to help. I think you're right. I will hit but you up they for have that. To have that have I'm learning as I go. As we get our committee's meeting, maybe they should be having a meeting. I don't know what they're doing. 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 Guys. Might be cold yeah, pizza if you get there like two, uh, but cold pizza. Yeah, it's worth it. Talk with the monthly lunch. But the average lunch, you know. I'm supposed to work too. Yeah, that's a good point. Yeah, you're not going to get those points. That's why you guys make the big money. Yeah, that's why you make the decisions. I'm going to work on that. I'm going to make the decisions. 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 I'
and the minutes will stand approved as presented. Uh, we are now under committee reports, finance committee, council member Reesner. No report, Madam President. Thank you. Long community planning, council member Leopard. No report, Madam President. Thank you. Materials and equipment, council member Jones. No report at this time, Madam President. Thank you. Personnel and labor relations, council member Perry. No report, Madam President. Recreation and public property, council member Wilkins. No report, Madam President. <clears throat> Street sidewalks and sewers, council member Thacker. Thank you, Madam President. <clears throat> A street sidewalks and sewers committee meeting was held March 28, 2023 at 515 p.m. in the Tiffin City Hall Council Chambers. Attending were committee members Cheyenne Thacker, Kenneth Jones, Kevin Reesner, Daniel Perry, and Stephen Leopard, along with council members Vicki Wilkins and John Sparr, City Law Director Brent Howard, Mayor Don Yanantuno, City Administrator Nick Dutro, Communications Director Liz Croak, and Chief Polly. Also attending were the following members of the community, Lee Wilkinson, Jerry and Jeannie Green, Bob Scheiber, Todd Sarka, Herb Elkert, Jim Lang, and Kevin Hughes. Thacker called the meeting to order. The purpose of the meeting was to discuss utility vehicle and golf cart usage on city streets and any other business presented. Lively discussion was had by all members of council. Jones mentioned that he was previously against a golf cart ordinance because of the, chil uh, of the chief of police, because the chief of police did not find golf carts to be safe on the road. He had only one constituent contact him previously to say they were for a golf cart ordinance. He has changed his mind and is now in favor of an ordinance allowing golf carts because he has had several people contact him in support. Jones has a grandson who used to drive a three-wheel vehicle with no issues. Reesner asked questions about the last time this measure was considered. Council has discussed the issue several times in, uh, in the last few years, beginning in 2019. Reesner asked about the cost of getting a permit on a vehicle. Council would decide the permit cost. Reesner is in support of separating golf carts from utility vehicles and what is permissible in a potential ordinance. He has not had issues in other municipalities that allow golf carts on the roadway. Leopard expressed his concern for allowing golf carts on city streets. If an ordinance is passed, he would be in favor, he will be in favor of several safety measures being included, such as no rear-facing passengers, seat belts, LED lights, <clears throat> brake lights, turn signals, etc. He also told a story of a custom golf cart salesman from Attica who told him allowing golf carts on city roadways is a bad idea. Leopard, I do have a change there. Leopard was in favor of utility vehicles because they're similar to cars in his mind. Perry had no issue with golf carts and other utility vehicles being on city streets, but would be in favor of some safety measures or potentially not allowing them on streets at night. Howard said he would encourage council to work with the Tiffin Police Department on criteria council may require and make TPD the local law enforcement agency to do the inspection. Howard said the ability to have under speed vehicles is limited by the state of Ohio to streets under 35 miles per hour, but council could make other restrictions. Perry asked if any city around Tiffin had repealed their golf cart measure. Howard said he was not aware of any municipalities that had. Wilkins was in favor of golf carts on the roadway and felt they were safer than bikes. Wilkins said that each person must make an individual choice about their own risks. The mayor is worried of having golf carts on the city streets will be dangerous, slow down traffic, and add to the congestion with all of the road work being done in the next few years. Perry said he thinks you would treat a golf cart you would treat golf carts like a car and slow down behind them just like any vehicle or bike. Mayor Yanantuno said it is easier to get around a bike than a golf cart. Police Chief Polly gave a report from his conversations with 10 police departments and other municipalities and research on crashes from the Ohio State Highway Patrol involving golf carts. Most of the chiefs he talked with from other communities said the main issue is education for drivers within the first few months with permits and inspections. Some of the communities had used a pilot program. Chief Polly's preference was that the TPD was that TPD be the agency issuing permits and doing inspections and that the limit would be on streets that are 25 miles per hour or less. Members of the community Jerry and Jeannie Green spoke about how they hope council will consider treating golf carts and utility vehicles as different vehicle types. They live in Hopewell Township and like to drive into town in their utility vehicle for date nights and errands. They encouraged the council to allow utility vehicles to drive up to 35 miles per hour. Bob Scheiber was in, fav in favor of a pilot program with some restrictions for safety. Kevin Hughes spoke on his previous attempts to get golf carts on city streets starting in 2019. He offered to bring back research he had previously given to council. Leopard asked for copies of previous ordinances drafted by the law director referencing golf carts. Perry asked to see ordinances passed by other similar communities. 
Jones is in favor of separating restrictions for utility vehicles and golf carts. The committee decided to do some more research on past ordinances prepared by Howard, ordinances passed by other communities, and discuss the topic again on April 17th at 6 p.m. Thacker will announce the meeting during the regular city council meeting on April 3rd, 2023. With no further business, the committee adjourned at 6.57 p.m. Thank you. Any questions for Council Member Thacker? Awesome. Okay, thank you. Um, economic development and downtown planning, Council Member Spar. No report, Madam President. Thank you. Uh, we are now under committee of the whole. Does anyone see the need to schedule an additional committee of the whole meeting? Um, again, as um, we discussed in our committee of the whole meeting today, there is one scheduled for uh, next, prior to next meeting at 6 p.m. to continue these discussions. And then additionally, um, on May 1st at 6 p.m. Uh, to continue the discussions regarding the city council candidate petition as well as any other business to come before council. Yes, Councilmember Thacker. Uh, I do have one change. I think when we had our meeting that we had discussed that it would stay with the street sidewalks and sewers committee first, so it's not a committee of the committee whole of meeting. The whole Got meeting. it. Okay. So the committee of the whole meeting is just May 1st then. Got it. Thanks. Um, awesome. We are now under reports of the officers. Her Honor, Mayor Dawn Yanatuno. Thank you, Madam President. I have several guests here this evening. And first, we'll start off with the Kiwanis Club of Seneca County with a special announcement. Their president, Randy Schroeder, is here, along with several members from the club, Joanne King and Lynette Cameron. So if you'd like to come up. Good evening, Mayor and City Council. My name is Randy Schroeder with the Kiwanis Club of Seneca County. I'm here to announce that our club is spearheading the campaign for the purchase of the Tiffin Police Dog. Along with the funds collected, special training will be, be provided to the officer that will care for the dog. The money will also be used for equipping a car and ongoing expenses. Kiwanis of Seneca County has always been an avid supporter of the city and the Tiffin Police Department. In the past, we have contributed heavily for Safety City, Citizens Police Academy, and provided blankets to be available in the police cruisers. It is the mission of Kiwanis Club of Seneca County to contribute to the well-being of children in the community. We feel this project will be beneficial to children to assist in detecting drugs and getting them off the street to, for our youth, so our youth are less vulnerable. It will also assist in the unfortunate event that a child in the community is missing. The dog will also be used in the schools for detecting drugs and presentations will be made for our local children. We are super excited to be an instrumental part of this fundraiser. It is our goal to raise a minimum of $10,000 for this project and hopefully exceed it. We will be displaying a bone with updated amounts collected at the fundraisers as the fundraiser takes um, in funds. Our first campaign will be asking the community to donate towards this worthwhile cause. There will be several avenues for people to donate. We will have Venmo and Zelle accounts established so people can donate with direct deposit. If a handwritten check is desired, it can be dropped off or mailed to 23 South Washington Street, which is the office of Century 21 Bolte Real Estate. And we are also discussing t-shirt sales to raise funds. Kiwanis of Seneca County is kicking off this fundraiser by donating $1,000 and will be applying for a matching grant from the Kiwanis Children's Fund. A bake sale and raffle has also taken place just this past weekend to, to start this fundraiser. Uh, for more information, you can um, check our Facebook page at Kwanzaa of Seneca County or contact myself at 419-443-5374. Thank you, and we look forward to working with the Tiffin Police Department. I think we have a picture, too, of your T-shirt, do we not? There we go. <laughs> Isn't that adorable? Our logo that we created. <laughs> And so on our behalf, I'd like to thank Kiwanis Club of Seneca County for stepping up to help raise funds for this great cause. It will be such an asset to our police department, our children, and the whole Tiffin community. And to start this off, Dan and I would like to personally deliver a check. Oh, thank you, Don. To start kicking off possible donations. <laughs> 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 Thank you. Liz, this is our police officer oh, yeah. in training for the canines. Thank you. Thank you. Appreciate it. 
Can I take a picture? I was going to just say, Awesome. The weather didn't work in our favor the best, but oh, it um, we're working up to the $10,000 limit. So. Thank you. We appreciate everyone's donation. Oh, everyone's time. I like them. <laughs> <laughs> thank you all for coming in. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, guys. Our next guest I have with us, Michelle Hess, is here from CASA to talk about their need for volunteers. If you remember, I met with CASA last fall and was very impressed with all they do on a very limited budget. So, Michelle. Thank you. Good evening, everyone. I will promise to be quick. I know getting late in the evening. Um, my name is Michelle Hess. I'm the Tri-County Assistant for CASA of Seneca, Sandusky, and Wyandotte Counties. For those that don't know what that program is, um, our nonprofit has been around in Seneca County for 32 years. And no, we do not sell tacos. We have gotten those calls before. <laughs> not <the> wrong CASA. <laughs> um, so our CASA stands for Court Appointed Special Advocates. And we're a nonprofit agency that trains people in the community to advocate for abused, neglected kids in court. So how we come about that situation is Children's Services will get a report that something's, something's going on with the family. They'll go and investigate that. If they find that that family needs some court intervention, they'll file that proper paperwork to get that family in, court, in front of the juvenile court judge. Um, for those that have never been around that situation, in that courtroom, you're going to have parents or caregivers with their attorneys. You're going to have Children's Services caseworker with their attorney. Um, and they're all kind of in that courtroom trying to figure out what's the best situation situation for this family in order to get them back to the way they found them. So we don't really have anyone there that's on the side of the child and speaking for what is specifically best for them. And sometimes they can get lost in, in that situation. So that's why it's great and needed for the CASA volunteers to be there. They, the court has the option to appoint either a CASA volunteer or a GAL attorney. And everyone knows that attorneys are paid quite a pretty penny. Um, so that in fact that the CASA program is here, we save the county thousands upon thousands of tax dollars um, by just having our volunteers do this. And we cover a whole bunch of training with our volunteers. They don't need to have any prior education in order to become a CASA. We cover courtroom procedures, um, um, proper advocacy techniques, um, trauma that all these children are, in, are enduring. Um, any situation that they may come across with a child because you know they're investigating this. Um, that's what the judges ask them to do in order to get this proper information in front of them. So our volunteers are going and getting police records, hospital records on the children, um, school records, you name it, we're allowed to have access to all that information. Um, we're also visiting with the family, trying to get a good general background of what's going on. And then we're actually talking to the child and asking them what they want. And that is super, super important for the child. If you think about what they've gone through in their situation where they maybe were moved out of their home into a foster home um, that may be an hour away. They don't have their friends. They don't have their family. Their siblings may be separated. And they weren't asked what they wanted out of that entire situation. So when the CASA volunteer and kind of slows things down, you know, what do you want out of this and explains what is going on, you know, that means a lot to the child and that CASA volunteer is super important to them that becomes a dependable person. So because they've built that important relationship, they then let them know what they want out of this situation that maybe they weren't trusting other adults um, in this very traumatic time in their life. So that's why it's super important to, to build that rapport with the child. Um, so we're informing the judge not only what we think is in the child's best interest, but what the child wants. Um, 
because without that information, the judge is kind of shooting in the dark with information from parents, information from children's services. Um, you can kind of be able to muck through all of those details with the CASA information that gets right down to the nitty gritty. You know, we're volunteers, we're not paid, we don't have a dog in the game. We're just here because we really care about these children and want them to be in the best possible situation. So again, we cover all that training um, with our volunteers. And I really wanted to not only educate you and the public about what CASA is, but talk about our upcoming training, which will be April 5th or 25th. It's a Tuesday evening at 5 p.m. And it's gonna take place at our Tiffin Casa office, which is 21 Court Street. Um, we are in dire need of volunteers right now. We are getting hounded a little bit with cases. Um, I know last year our numbers in 2022, we served 283 children in all three of our counties with 59 volunteers. 99 of those children were from Seneca County with 31 volunteers and 16 children went unserved because we just don't have the volunteers to be able to assign to all the cases. Um, looking at our projected numbers for this year, we're, we're going to come close to that number. Um, COVID has really ramped up um, the cases in all three of the counties that we represent um, because of the mental health and, and everything going on, stressors in people's life. And it kind of just really, um, elevated those situations. So, and because of that, we had a trifold of those situations elevating and volunteers decreasing because, you know, people have so much going on in their life. Um, if you've heard from any program that recruits volunteers, it is a struggle. <laughs> it is a struggle to get people to volunteer because there's so much going on in people's lives and you're always bombarded with, we need, we need, we need. Um, so I hate being that person, but we really do need the volunteers, um, especially for this, this training in all three of our counties. Um, there's kids in, in Seneca County that desperately need um, people to be there for them. And I just hope that you guys can help us spread the word and we can get a super great training going. And so again, it's April 25th. Yes. And what the, was the time again? 5 p.m. And that's not really like the first start of our training, that's just the meet and greet. So anyone that's interested will come out, um, ask any questions they have about volunteering, um, talk to the staff, and then we set our five week training course that night to make sure it works with everyone's schedule. Any questions for Michelle? Councilman Jones. I, I have, you keep talking about children, and when I hear the word children, I'm thinking very young. Mm -hmm. What age group do you work with? Is, or is it limited to a... Nope, we have birth all the way till 18. <laughs> oh, okay. Well, right. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Member Thacker. Uh, do you have a call out on social media or something that we could help share? Or do you have flyers that we could help pass out? Or, you know, other ways that we can get the word out so we can make sure that we help you? Yes, I have flyers and our social media going. I can get that to whoever needs that. Yeah, that would be great. We, the city's account did post that okay. uh, training. All right, I'll share it from there too. Okay, great. Thank you, I appreciate that. Councilmember Perry. I just had a question. Um, if somebody were to volunteer, um, <coughs> obviously everybody's schedules are different. Mm -hmm. You have some volunteers that can do like a case a year and some that can handle more, I'm guessing, or I mean, do you like set a schedule out? How do you how do you handle? We honestly let it up to the volunteer. We're kind of <coughs> at their mercy okay, yeah. um, because they're the ones doing all this work uh, for no pay. So if they're the type of person that's like, I just want one case at a time, then that's all that we give them. Um, if they're a type of volunteer that's a really go-getter and can handle five cases at a time, we do have volunteers that do that. We have volunteers that swear into multiple counties, um, take cases in... Uh, all three counties. Um, we have volunteers that are kind of duos. We have marriage um, volunteers. So um, maybe one of the spouses can't go to court because their job just has that restriction and the other spouse can. So they'll work that case together, be talking to the family members together, but the one will go to court um, because they can make that work. Uh, we have volunteers from all walks of life, any job uh, out there. We have nurses, teachers, um, retired people, students in college. Um, we welcome everyone because our, stu our students, our kids are from all walks of life. So we need volunteers that represent those kids and that they can be that positive role model and, and know that 
they can get out of this situation that they're in. Mm -hmm. yeah. And for Councilmember oh, Stark, go ahead. Um, how long? Um, how long is a case? How long does it take to get through a case? Average. I'm mm -hmm. sure it's different. It's hard to say average wise. Uh, we ask that our volunteers commit to two years because. Um, for those that don't know, in the juvenile court, they when you have a case open, um, they give the family two years. Well, I take that back. They give the family a year to be able to address the situation that was brought before them. And within that year, if they're making progress, they will give them two six-month extensions. Mm -hmm. um, if in that time frame things just have not worked out and the children cannot return safely home, they'll find a different placement for them, whether that be with other family members. Um, or be adopted if, if that's what is needed to happen. It doesn't mean that the case will last that long. We've had cases that are a couple months because the family was able to really, you know, knock out those issues that were brought before the court. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Thank you. I just have one more yeah. curiosity question. Have you ever had a, um, a volunteer um, that ended up fostering or adopting uh, one of the cases that they're on, or is that right against... We can't do that. We've had a volunteer that got really attached to a family um, and wanted to offer themselves up as a placement. And because they did that, we then had to remove them okay. um, as the CASA because that would get a little biased, a little sure. messy yeah. in there. And I know, I don't know if anyone has this question. I may not have mentioned it. The average um, time frame that the volunteers spend a month is about five to eight hours on a case. Um, so looking at a month's time frame, it's it's not a huge ask. <laughs> it is more than you know volunteering a couple hours on a weekend at a soup kitchen or a humane society. This is more of an emotional um, connection and emotional volunteer <coughs> work that we're asking. Um, so it takes a special person to be able to become a CASA volunteer. Um, but anyone that's really committed can do it. Anything else? Michelle, thank you so much for you. what you do. And <laughs> good luck with getting volunteers. I, I'm hoping a bunch of people will sign up listening to this I hope tonight. So. Thank you for having really, me. Really appreciate you coming in. Mm -hmm. thank you. Thanks, guys. Moving on, uh, Candy's here with us from Police Dispatch, and we have a proclamation because this is 911 month. So, okay. whereas the call to 911 is never an easy one to make, but when it is needed, the voice on the other end of the line is of the greatest comfort. <laughs> Through stress and personal struggle, they continue to deliver life saving communication on the worst day of someone's life. Whereas 911 is nationally recognized as a number to call in an emergency to receive immediate help from police, fire, emergency medical services, or other appropriate emergency response entities. And whereas people of all ages use 911, and it is crit critical to educate the public of all ages on the proper use of 911, and whereas a growing segment of the population, including the deaf, hard of hearing, deaf, blind, and individuals with speech disabilities increasingly communicate with non-traditional text, video, and instant messaging communication services and anticipate that these services will be able to connect directly to 911. And whereas thousands of 911 calls are made every year by children properly trained to use the use of 911, resulting in lives saving Life Save, which underscores the critical importance of training children early in life about 911. And therefore, be it resolved, I, Don M. Yanantuno, Mayor of the City of Tiffin, do hereby proclaim the month of April in the City of Tiffin as 911 Education Month on this third day of April in the year of our Lord, 2023. And so, Candy, if you'd like to come up for this. Thank you for all you do. Thank you for the proclamation. Thank you so much. Okay, I appreciate it. Okay. Thank you. Perfect. Thanks. 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 The cell phones are hands-free only starting tomorrow. So doesn't matter if you got it up here or not, they can pull you over. It's a warning for now. Yeah. <laughs> Six months, it goes into effect. It's a lot to be on your ear, right? Nope. 
Oh, on the, in the ear. Yeah, you're that, allowed to that, hold it to your ear. No, you can't hold it oh, to your really? ear. Oh, really? That's not, I didn't, okay, I'm, I misunderstood that. It has to be totally hands-free. Hmm. So just my public service announcement for tonight. <laughs> <laughs> and we have with us tonight, department head reports continue tonight, and fifth up is Chief Rob Chapel from our Tiffin Fire and Rescue Department, and he has been so patient waiting tonight. I know he's been anxious to give us his report, so... Chief Rob, take it away. I can only imagine how anxious everybody is to hear it. <laughs> so, thank you, Mayor, for the invitation. And uh, Madam President, thank you for the, uh, the open forum to uh, once again come in and speak with the members of uh, our city council and talk a little bit about some of the, the things that have been going on in the last year for our fire department, some of the things we're looking at, at accomplishing uh, here in 2023. So. Uh, one of the things that we had put together uh, towards the end of last year, uh, albeit on a budget, um, was a promotional video highlighting uh, the Tiffin Fire Rescue Division, uh, primarily aimed at uh, a recruitment effort, but, but also still educational for the community to help them understand more about what we do and how we do it. Um, we, we wanted to bring in Morgan Freeman for like a voiceover <laughs> that was way out of the budget. Um, you, know, it, you see a lot of me in it, so that tells you what kind of money we were working with. So, um, but uh, ju just in the short time that uh, we, we've had our hands on the finished product, um, we've uh, been able to send it out to uh, Sentinel uh, Joint Vocational School uh, for them to play in their public safety classes. Uh, the career exploration class is trying to target some of the, the younger generation that um, might still be trying to decide what they want to do for a living. Um, it's been on our social media. Um, I, I recently presented at the um, Safety Council and was able to, to use the video there. So it's, it's going to be a versatile uh, video for us and um, you know, hopefully sell the department. The, the goal behind it was to not just make it a, a highlight reel of cool things that we get to do as firefighters, but to also uh, talk about what we do in the city of Tiffin itself and the opportunities for uh, fun and entertainment. Um, because when we're looking to recruit people into the department, it, it's great that they work for Tiffin Fire, but, but we want them to be an involved member of the community as well as we go out on a call now. Right on cue. <laughs> we, we do that a little bit. We're going to talk about that more. They're preempting me. Um, so w without further ado, we'll, we'll kind of jump into the, the video here. Oh, did we mute it? It worked, it worked great in rehearsal earlier. <laughs> of course it did. All right, we'll try again. All right. Take two. And I'll fix it. Welcome to the Tiffin Fire Rescue Division. Our department was established in 1894. And while our department is very rich in its history, we also are rising to meet the occasion of today's fire service in an effort to better serve our citizens and our community. In order to be successful in the fire service, you have to create a culture that is deep in training, education, community involvement, and camaraderie with everyone who's here. Our department currently is comprised of 36 firefighters and paramedics, responding on over 3,700 calls per year now. The Tiffin Fire and Rescue Division is, in a lot of ways, like having a family away from home. We pride ourselves in having a great staff that provides a professional service to our community. To me, being a Tiffin firefighter is an honor. I get to go to the best job in the world, and I have the opportunity to serve a great community alongside some excellent firefighters and some of my closest friends. I get to go to my job that I'm excited about and I love, and I get to have fun at the same time. In addition to providing fire and EMS services for our community, we also provide 
have several fire prevention programs that we feel really benefits and keeps our citizens safe. Being an education community, we pride ourselves in being a pillar in educating the public through different public education programs, not only for just young children, but for adolescents and adults as well. that one person can make a difference, but we are large enough that we have a well-rounded team surrounding you. And whether it's going out, participating in preschool visits, or working with college resident advisors, or participating in parades or other downtown activities, there's always something to do here to engage with the community, and they engage right back with us. As someone who did not grow up in the city of Tiffin, there were a lot of things that drew me to the Tiffin Fire and Rescue Division. Uh, not only the department itself, but everything the community offers. The community is extremely proactive in all kinds of different activities for both families and individuals. To me, being a firefighter paramedic is the greatest job in the world, with no question. It's an opportunity that every single day you know that you're going to have some sort of positive impact in somebody's life. The people that we have working here with us at Tiffin Fire Rescue are some of the best in the area, and I couldn't be more proud to work with them day in and day out. If you come to join us here at our fire department, you're going to be surrounded by some of the best of the best, and they will help you to develop your skills and abilities in an effort to make you a better firefighter and paramedic yourself. So that's the, the promo video. Um, I don't know, I, I thought it turned out pretty cool, but I'm, I'm not really an expert at evaluating these things. <laughs> um, so yeah, we, we certainly hope to be using that video a, a lot more. And uh, it's just an exciting thing for, for the department to have. We've never really done anything like that. And uh, there, there are departments around the country that have started using uh, things such as that to, to try and help with their recruitment efforts as well. And, um, I just, again, thought it did a nice job of highlighting both the department and the city. So, um, so some things that we did uh, last year uh, to, to kind of recap, um, participated in the Tiffin City Schools REACH program uh, with Ms. Mrs. Hall's class at Noble. Um, that was uh, certainly a, a unique and fun experience for me, not having uh, worked with that age group in a while. <laughs> um, but uh, yeah, fourth graders, wow. Um, God bless Mrs. Hall. <laughs> so, uh, we also uh, worked along with Tiffin Police and uh, Jill Goshi and her team uh, with the Handle with, Handle with Care program. Uh, we actually were able to uh, utilize that on a couple different occasions. Um, where one in particular where we had a house fire going on. It was during the, the day while the kids were at school and before somebody might find out uh, through social media and, hey, is this your house that's on fire? Uh, instead, they're gonna be able to, uh, they were pulled out of class and, and were able to have the news more gently uh, given to them. Uh, so that it's a good feeling to know that there's programs like that to assist the, the youngsters in the community. Um, we had a, a BRAG program student, uh, which is Bridging Readiness After Graduation. Uh, his name was Peyton. Uh, with Sentinel. Uh, he came in and for, for several weeks, uh, for a couple hours, uh, once or twice a week, would come in and uh, just kind of like do a job shadow uh, with some of the people uh, at our station and would get involved with trainings and everything. And um, it was just kind of a, a fun experience for, for our people to have uh, somebody. We, we don't have normally a lot of opportunities for like a job shadow thing. You're either there or you're not to work. And um, so he, he was uh, already committed and is listed into the U.S. military. Um, but he, he was, I think, definitely having some second thoughts about uh, wishing he could maybe stay and uh, get his fire training and, and maybe come work for us. So we might see him again one point down the road. Uh, the Qantas Club cooking show, uh, that, that's always a, a, a fun evening. Uh, that was uh, Chief Polly and myself, our, the first time we were there as celebrity uh, chefs. Um, <laughs> 
still doesn't seem like our, the right title for it, but uh, we, we did our best and it was uh, a good time. Uh, the Touch a Truck event at Lincoln Elementary, it was great having that back uh, following COVID and everything. We had a couple years there, we really didn't get to do that. And um, it's always nice to, to get the big trucks out and uh, take them over to Lincoln School for the kids to get to see and enjoy and uh, ask us all kinds of fun questions. Uh, because so, there's always something that you would never expect to have a question about, and they, they nail it every time. Um, <laughs> the, the third grade tours, uh, the citywide tours where they go through, and they'll, they'll tour City Hall and the police station, and then they, they come to the fire station last because that's the coolest place, you know, go out with the, the best part. Um, so that, that's always nice. Uh, we have uh, firefighter Matt Gabauer that uh, normally does that for us here at the downtown station and talks about some of the history of the department and what we do. Um, and then Lieutenant Scott Brooks, um, the last couple of years has been up at the 9-11 Memorial uh, trying to educate uh, the today's third graders about what happened on 9-11 and uh, try and make sure that nobody ever uh, forgets that. Um, we had a, a fun breakfast at Kiwanis Manor, uh, had the whole crew over there the one morning, uh, participated in a Shark Tank event uh, that was put together at Tiffin Middle, Middle School by Mrs. Cook. Um, where we were basically the, the sharks and had to bid on uh, some of the business models and products that the students had put together. And uh, there are definitely some aspiring entrepreneurs uh, waiting uh, in the wings there at Tiffin Middle School. So very cool thing. Um, Public Safety Career Day with Sentinel. They, they brought some of their students in to uh, take a tour of the station, learn a little bit more about what we're doing and uh, try and uh, preach that, that good news about uh, becoming a firefighter one day. Um, that takes us up through the end of May. Um, after that, we, we got uh, into summertime, the TU Forensics Camp. Uh, I've talked about this before. Um, very cool camp that Tiffin University's done for a while now, and uh, we were asked to take, a, take part in it. Um, it was the, the first and only camp of its kind in the country that they knew of anyway that involved anything dealing with fire investigation. Uh, so we had um, two small rooms that we had built uh, in a, a gravel parking lot and basically established uh, two different arson type scenarios um, to create the fires. And then the students were able to go through and learn about how we investigate that type of fire. Um, so it was a great opportunity. Um, our Youth Fire Academy uh, that, that several of our members put together, uh, Scott Brooks, Isaac Heiser, Andrew Bros, Drew Lucius, um, that's with uh, our Tiffin Parks Department, um, which I, I believe tomorrow, uh, or no, the 5th, uh, registration opens for that. Um, so they're going to be doing that again this year. Um, the, they'll get 14 or 15 uh, of our youth um, involved in that. And we, we basically run it like a mini fire academy. We teach them CPR. Uh, we teach them how to advance hoses and fight fires and use fire extinguishers, uh, all those cool uh, hands-on things that, that make it fun. Um, and it, it grows and gets better every year. Um, our resident advisor training with Tiffin University, uh, we already had one success story on, on how that uh, can, can play out for uh, the safety of everyone. Um, we actually did a, a fire department family picnic uh, this, this last fall at Oakley. Um, some that I had really been wanting to do uh, a lot more than I'd let on uh, for the last couple years. And uh, it, it was just a really, really cool experience getting everybody together um, and reminding myself that, wow, I am getting old because all these guys have young kids now and you know, I, here I am with my teenager. It's, <laughs> it's not fun. Um, Safety City, uh, th thanks to Jared Watson with Tiffin PD for uh, continuing his work with organizing that. Uh, and then our, our personnel, Travis Staley, Matt Gabauer, um, and Lieutenant Matt Gray, who have really, really worked to put together a fantastic program uh, for, for our portion of Safety City. Uh, the Get Out to Walk event at Washington Elementary is always a good time. Uh, again, listen to those uh, young elementary age uh, school students with, with their questions for us. Uh, the downtown trick or treat event and the parade uh, that, that we did the year before was a lot of fun. Um, the CERT class uh, that was being held out at the public safety building had reached out to us about staging. Uh, they have like a mock disaster drill 
that they, they have to complete towards the end of that. They asked if we'd be interested in assisting, and uh, I think we put together a pretty good evolution for them, and um, it, we had some, some good people to, to assist with that. Uh, and then senior bingo events, um, we, we were doing the uh, uh, car bingo uh, out at the Willows. We've been out to Commission on Aging for uh, the, the senior bingo there. Uh, just trying to be out and interact with the public. Um, to me, I, I understand that the fire department is just a, an expensive insurance policy that the city provides to all of its citizens, but I, I think we can do better than that. I think we should be out in the public interacting with everyone. <coughs> and letting them know who it is that you know could be showing up we don't necessarily need you to remember our names or anything like that but you know it, it shouldn't necessarily always be the first time that a lot of these people are ever seeing us um you know let, let's get out there let's be involved in the community that, that supports us and makes the, the job possible so some of our highlights uh from Last year, uh, we implemented a new record management system. I know that doesn't sound really exciting, but it, um, it, it's allowing us to pull a lot of our resources that uh, we have to track, not, not just our EMS reporting and fire reporting, but also our fire inspections, our training, uh, daily truck checks, uh, daily and weekly uh, med box <coughs> checks, all the different little bits and pieces of records that we create within the department that we have to be able to manage. And previously, it was kind of just spread out among several different platforms. Um, and with the new vendor, we're able to kind of bring everything back under one umbrella. And it's, it's really helping us as we move forward through the implementation to uh, do a better job of, of tracking all that. Uh, we accepted a, an assistance to firefighter grant award uh, from FEMA for writ packs. Um, I, I was in earlier when uh, with that money was uh, sent to us, uh, the rapid intervention uh, packs that in the event of a downed firefighter is what they're primarily aimed at um, assisting with. We keep these, uh, we're, we'll have two of them, they're, we're still waiting for them to be shipped. Um, one for like a residential uh, house fire, another that would be for larger commercial occupancies that uh, it's right there with everything we need to grab and go and send in with uh, two personnel typically to affect the rescue of a downed firefighter uh, at uh, an emergency scene. We did a review of our uh, EMS billing processes, uh, everything from looking at the, the company that we've been using for many years and, and kind of evaluating them against other competitors and in that market, uh, decided actually we, we are getting pretty good service and rates from uh, Change Healthcare and uh, we're, we're happy to continue working with them. Uh, we also looked at what our ambulance billing rates are. Uh, periodically, Medicare will um, change the billing rates, which uh, we would be eligible to be billing for uh, by ordinance. And as of right now, there, there's uh, no need for any changes to be made. Our, our billing rates are uh, right in line with what CMS will generally reimburse for. Um, and we were also looking at ways to try and increase opportunities for revenue. Um, we, we do a lot of uh, treat on scenes and without ever transporting the patient. And unless we do transport them, we are unable to bill for that service. Um, we, we have diabetic patients that we may go to their house, we'll start an IV, we'll, we'll give them medicine to bring their blood sugar back up. And by the time we're done, they're back to normal, they're, they're feeling good again, which is great, that's the goal. Um, but we incur expenses with, with those supplies, with the personnel costs and the, you know, taking the ambulance there. All those little things start to, to add up, but we aren't able to, to capture any uh, revenue from that service. Um, so we were looking at some opportunities that could possibly exist, um, but right now uh, with current language in ORC, there just really aren't a whole lot of avenues for that. Um, but we're gonna you know, continue watching for those and, and make changes as necessary. Uh, we ordered a new ambulance in 2022, and no, this is not the one that we just did the push-in ceremony for. Um, the, that ambulance was ordered in February of 2022, so a little over a year ago now, and we're expecting delivery of it probably by February of 2024. Um, 
there are, a, dare I say, obscene uh, lead times for, for ambulances and, and vehicles of that sort right now, partially because of uh, the chassis shortages, uh, but also because there's uh, so much federal stimulus money that is out there that the demand for ambulances is just well beyond the capacity that manufacturers have to produce them. Uh, so supply and demand, basic economics 101 tells you prices are going up, lead times are also going up, um, but at least we're in line uh, for one. The, the goal will be that we will uh, be maintaining four ambulances instead of just three. Uh, and as we get more into the call volume stuff here shortly, uh, you'll, you'll start to hopefully understand the, the need for that. We had a, a walk-in sudden inspection. You know, business owners may not like it when we walk in to do fire inspections, but when I get pulled out of a training by Amanda, our administrative assistant, and she says, hey, uh, Board of Pharmacy is here for an inspection. That is one way, if you're ever trying to get the fire chief's attention, you will get it right now. Um, <laughs> Board of Pharmacy is a pretty big deal in our little world. Um, you know, if, if they were to decide we were uh, not doing adequate uh, work, then they, they do have full authority to shut us down, uh, thereby shutting EMS down in the city. Um, so we, we do take that very seriously. and. Um, I'm happy to report that we went through the entire impromptu inspection with no real red flags raised. They had a couple of requests for documentation that we were able to provide over the next week, and uh, they were very content with all of our uh, processes and storage and everything that we do uh, relating to that. And I, I have to give a lot of credit to <clears throat> Captain Mike Steyer uh, for that. He, he's been heading up our uh, EMS medication uh, program for several years now, and, and he really does uh, do a fantastic job with it, and uh, so credit to him on that. Uh, when Dr. Fitzpatrick, uh, who had been an ER physician out at Mercy Hospital for many years, retired, um, the state no longer allowed for him to continue on as our medical director. Um, and neither he nor we were aware immediately that when he said that he was stepping away from actively practicing as an ER physician, that that meant that we immediately no longer had a medical director. Um, so we uh, had very quickly reached out to the Northwest Ohio EMS Symposium, which is uh, a, a or consortium, I'm sorry, consortium, not symposium, uh, that has, uh, they, they provide services for over 80 different departments, as I understand it, throughout Northwest Ohio. <coughs> including Seneca County EMS now. Um, so we have the, the two agencies that provide services throughout our county um, working under the same medical direction with the same protocols. It, it helps keep things very fluid so that if we do end up on a larger incident, everybody's playing out of the same playbook essentially. Um, Dr. Sauber, uh, who actually has ties back to New Regal, um, was very excited to be able to work with our department. Uh, he's he's uh, voiced on several occasions says, uh, enthusiasm for the things that we're doing and um, is definitely uh, enjoying, I think, working with us as much as we are working with them. So pretty cool there. Um, we re-implemented, re I suppose that's really a word, uh, a chaplain program. Um, for, for many years when I was new with the department, we had Father Dave Ross uh, from St. Mary's that was our chaplain and it, he was amazing. Um, when he took the transfer over to Lima, um, we kind of just never, it, it, I think it, it might have been they just left such big shoes to fill that we just never really found anybody else. And uh, last summer, um, George Morgan, who retired uh, from our department, um, he reached out and said, hey, you know, I, I would really be interested in, you know, kind of doing some of that. Uh, George is a wonderful person of faith. Uh, he not only knows this job, but he knows our department. And it, I, I could not think of a, a better, more qualified person in this world to probably step in and uh, offer that service to our members than George. And I'm just, uh, I'll be eternally grateful to him for, for making that offer uh, on his own. Um, and he's, he's already been, been there for us on several occasions. Um, we did a training fire on Tiffany University's campus uh, that was actually kind of highlighted in some of the video. Um, Mayor was there for that. Uh, the Tiffany University Drone Academy was there. 
Um, so we, we had a lot of different trainings going on all simultaneously, um, but it, it was a, a great learning experience for, for us as well. Uh, every other year we do a paramedic refresher class in-house. Um, one of the, the nice things about that is we can kind of work at our own pace and develop a curriculum based off of um, what, uh, in, in this case, our deputy chief, Mike Homan, uh, identifies as areas that maybe we need a little bit more time spent with or, or things that we can improve upon. And uh, he put together the program and, and did the, the bulk of the legwork. We, we have other instructors on the crews that were able to uh, assist with some of the instruction as well. And it's, it's nice then because it's not the same person teaching every single day and um, it, it just helps to make it a little bit more diverse. And it, it's, a, it's a good thing, it's required. We have to keep the certifications up, so. Um, we also launched a YouTube page. I know we're just a fire department, but we are really getting this technology thing down. We're up to YouTube now. We're gonna skip MySpace, but YouTube we're at. So um, they, right now, if, if as a member of the public, if anybody was to go to our YouTube page, you would only see the promotional video that uh, I started this presentation with. What its real purpose serves is for in-house use. Um, a lot of our personnel uh, have taken their own initiatives and are filming training videos. Here's some basic knots. Here's how you tie the knot. This is what you use it for. Here's how we can advance a hose down a hallway. Here's how we could advance hose up a stairwell. And we're, we're putting all that stuff on video, which then uh, one of our firefighters, Nick Houston, is then editing and making a cool little intro thing for, um, and then that gets posted on uh, our YouTube site. So then members of our department, whenever they feel the need, can go and review any of these training videos and, and learn, uh, again, when it's convenient for them. Um, you know, the, starting a chainsaw. Uh, for, for some of us, that might be the easiest thing in the world. We might do it all the time. Other people, they, they may not touch a chainsaw, but once or twice a year. Um, and they, they may forget exactly how to put the choke on the right position after you've you know it started to turn over. Well, here's a chance now that when nobody else can see them, they can go and watch this video and refresh on that so that they can feel good about it and not have to worry about being embarrassed in front of the, the whole, whole group there. So kind of a cool thing. Uh, we also had a new collective bargaining agreement established. Uh, this will run through the end of 2025 now. Um, it, it was, uh, a unique experience, my first time uh, being uh, the fire chief that we, we've, uh, I was on that side of the table, and um, but I, I think we were able to put together a pretty good contract that uh, not only helps the department, but uh, is, is something beneficial to the city as well. So in 22, we obviously had a lot of really fun and exciting things happen, but uh, we did say goodbye to um, some, some really dear members of our department uh, Joe Sugar, who served with Tiffany EMS for uh, many years, um, he he passed away, and um, it, he was always. I, I never got to work with Joe, but uh, the, the the people that I, I work with currently that did work with him uh, spoke very very highly of him. Uh, chief Tom Huss, um, who was chief here for 17 years, 17 18 years, um, he was. Uh, at the Willows uh, in town, and I may have had an inside source that let me know that he was out there. Um, and I, I asked if it would be okay if they thought I would come in and talk to him one day. I'd never worked for Chief Us, had never met him. Um, and he had agreed, told me, yeah, come on out whenever. And I, I was able to go out there. We talked for probably an hour and a half. And for me, personally, I, Probably the coolest experience I'll ever have as fire chief. I'm just going to leave it at that. Um, being able to to talk to him and hear the stories uh, from his career and uh, the the things that he remembers, um, th those are going to be memories that I, I will always carry with me. Um, very very cool experience and ever appreciative of him being willing to take that time to to talk with me. Um, and then also uh, firefighter paramedic Sean Tyler. Uh, who, who passed away back in June from cancer. Um, that was a, a really difficult time for all the department to, to get through. Um, the, the very first time when we had uh, a group come in to assist us with like honor guard training, um, 
it was one of those, they, they had us in the gravel lot where the Salvation Army used to be, and they're trying to teach us how to stand at attention and how to give a proper salute. And I, I'm not prior military or anything, and it's just like, we really have a long ways to go. Um, but everybody was just so dedicated to it, and we're putting their heart and soul into it for Sean, for his family, and it was just an amazing job that we were able to do for for them uh, with the funeral, and um, I don't know, I, it, it was a terrible thing, and I hope to to never have the the department go through it again. Um, but I, I can say that we most assuredly uh, gave Sean what he wanted. He he had literally pre-planned everything about uh, who he wanted it, doing what at his funeral, and um, we we gave him exactly what he asked for. I think so. That's the, the best tribute we could do. So now the, uh, back to the fun stuff here, yeah, uh, numbers. So our uh, overall emergency call volume, uh, th this is fire and EMS combined. Um, it's definitely trending upwards, I, I think is uh, safe to say. Um, from 2020 to 2022, we're, we're at about a 19.7% increase in call volume. Um, if we look all the way back to 2009, uh, not for any reason in particular, it's just I happened to find numbers from 2009, uh, we, we responded on 2,229 calls that year. Uh, comparing that to 2022, that's a 66% increase in call volume, and we have the same size department today that we did then. Um, so definitely the, uh, the workload is increasing as we respond on more and more incidents per year. Um, when we break this down by district, um, we can see that the uh, wards one, two, and three are all seeing pretty steady increases in, in their call volumes for us. Fourth ward is staying pre pretty level, uh, slightly decreasing. County's still keeping us pretty busy. Um, 2020 was a bit of an unusual year for us. We didn't actually have any growth. It was a flat year over 2019 uh, at the uh, or origination of COVID. Um, a lot of people just, it was like somebody took the phone off the hook for us. People were afraid to, to leave their house. They were afraid to go to the emergency room because if, if you didn't really have COVID, you almost certainly would have by the time you left the hospital. And I think a lot of people were just afraid to, 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 to risk it. Um, so our call volume actually decreased pretty sharply there early in 2020, rebounded later in the year, but um, it's been growing by leaps and bounds ever since. When we put it to uh, percentages, the, the third ward uh, always is, is gonna be out in the lead for us uh, with 30% of the call volume. Uh, if you were to strip out some of the, the call volume from the county, um, and mutual Third word aid. councilman's looking at me. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. It's you now. <laughs> right. Um, you know, the, the, that number's, again, using strictly calls within the city, the, the real number is probably closer to 40% of our call volumes in the third ward. Um, not only is it the busiest area for us, it's also the longest one to get to, um, coming from the downtown station. EMS calls, uh, with that being the majority of our, our business, we um, can also see the, the increase in EMS calls for service. So looking at our staffing, um, th this was a big thing that I talked about in last year's presentation and how we were trying to bolster uh, recruiting and retention efforts. We, we've seen some uh, stabilizing uh, overall in what we've been doing. It seems as though a lot of our uh, social media uh, presence is, is kind of paying off a little bit. It's a common thing when we're interviewing candidates for the positions and we ask them, you know, what's what's so special about Tiffin? Right now, if you're looking to get a job as a firefighter, you can go anywhere, why, why Tiffin? And the, the general response is along the lines of, I just see everything that you guys are doing and putting it on Facebook or Instagram, and um, that's what I wanna be a part of. Um, we, I'm trying to help create that image, true image, that we are a department that is advancing, where we are 
you know, even if we had to do it a little with, with a little kicking and screaming, we are moving into the 21st century and we, we're getting there. Um, so when we look at the, this chart here that shows where our uh, age groups are, when you consider that we've got 14 people that are 15 years or higher uh, in their years of service with the department and everybody else is under that, um, we have a very young department. And over the next couple of years, it's only going to continue getting younger and younger. Um, each time a, a person with 25 or 30 years of experience leaves, that is a lot of knowledge about the buildings and the neighborhoods throughout our city that they are taking with them. And we're, we're trying to bolster that to try and uh, get some of our younger uh, generation of firefighters to learn and understand that so that it doesn't ever result in a decrease in the level of protection and service that we provide to the city. Um, we're also hoping that through the, the new collective bargaining agreement, we were able to close the, the gap previously uh, when you would start on probationary pay and then move to first year, so day 366, you would be getting a 24% pay increase. And that, that was just a significant jump that it really made our starting salary look very bad. And it was it, it, difficult to use that number on recruiting efforts because we know so many other departments are paying so much better. And my, <clears throat> my belief was people would see that number and then not even bother applying to, to come here. So what we were able to do was close that gap. It's now actually written into the contract that first year pay and proby pay can be no less than 10% uh, of what you'd be making at first year rate. Um, so it, it does make that, that starting number a little bit better, um, which we'll, we'll see the next time we have to go and establish a new hiring list if, if it really will uh, appear to pay off, but it, it certainly should. Um, yeah. So plans for 2023. Um, we're looking to bring uh, training opportunities into our department. Uh, Mike Holman, our deputy chief, uh, who's just been crushing it for us, um, he's been reached out to the Ohio Fire Academy. They have several trailers available, that, a couple of which were here last year, uh, set up in lot six. They've got two more uh, that we're gonna be bringing up this year. Uh, one's a search and rescue trailer um, that's gonna be here for six days. And then in October, a uh, flashover trailer. Um, when a fire eventually gets hot enough, all the smoke, uh, eventually the carbon particulates and everything in it get hot enough that the smoke will start to burn. We call that a flashover. Um, usually 12 to 1400 degrees, depending on how, how fun things are right then. Um, but so we, we're gonna have those two additional trailers. Um, and it's not just for our department to train in. We, we always invite the county fire departments, Fostoria Fire, um, we, we want it to be a, a, an asset to the departments throughout the county that uh, can hopefully benefit and it gives us an opportunity to train alongside them as well. So we all kind of know each other a little bit better. Um, one thing I didn't include on the slide because it was kind of a last minute uh, addition. Um, I've talked about our ambulance that had the engine that, that blew up in it. Uh, not quite like Hollywood blow up, but head gasket went out in it possibly we think. Um, it's been out at Tiffin Ford since uh, October. Just got a call uh, at the end of last week that the new motor has finally arrived and uh, they're, they're putting a rush on it to try and get that put back together for us and back in service uh, so that hopefully we'll be back to that fourth ambulance sooner rather than later. Um, and that will be a, a tremendous benefit to us and, and make me sleep a little bit better at night. <laughs> So, Chief, do you uh, want to tell them the process? Because you mentioned how chassis are not available. Do you want to tell mm -hmm. them what happened with that particular engine that day? Uh, yeah, so I had a phone call uh, from Jim Distel, uh, the service manager out there, that, um, saying that, hey, yeah, the, uh, the motor just arrived. I've never seen anything shipped quite like this. We had to sign a document from Ford saying that, it's uh, it, this motor with this number is going into this ambulance with this VIN number. If it's not, we're not sending it to you. Um, and it, he's like, I, I've, they've never made us do anything like that before. 
It was uh, supposedly photographed as it was leaving the plant in Michigan, and then again when it arrived here in Tiffin. I asked if there was like any black SUVs that were escorting it here as well. Um, I, I hope the answer was yes, because I really want that motor in this ambulance. Um, but yeah, it's, it's uh, kind of a, a tough thing to come by right now, apparently still, and I'm just very, very thankful that it's here. It'll be great to have that ambulance back in service for us. Um, the April 8th, 2024 solar eclipse, we're, we're definitely gonna be doing some planning and preparation for that. Um, March of next year will not be the ideal time to start that process. Um, so definitely uh, mark that date on your calendar, circle it, and um, it, it could be interesting. Uh, if, you're, if you're not a fan of big crowds, uh, pray for rainy weather, I think, is the best thing we can do. <laughs> we applied for uh, FEMA, AFG, uh, again, the Assistance to Firefighter Grant to purchase all new SCBA. Uh, those are the air packs that we wear into the fires. Uh, the current equipment is 10 years old, two NFPA revisions old. By FEMA standards, it's considered obsolete at this point. Um, it, it still works well, but we are starting to see some mechanical issues here and there, but nothing too bad. Um, but uh, if that grant is approved, it would allow for us to be able to purchase 38 uh, SCBA air packs, um, and the, the requested dollar amount was $323,000. So we'll, uh, we're definitely keeping our fingers crossed for that. Alleviate the burden on the capital budget if we can pull that one off. Um, also, more and more recently, uh, the application period just recently closed for the FEMA SAFER grant. This is a, a staffing grant, which we've pursued the last couple of years. Um, we, uh, and unfortunately, it, we were unsuccessful in those two previous attempts. Uh, this time, we're, we're trying a little different approach, um, and we're actually looking for five positions with that. Um, it would take the department up to the full authorized strength, uh, as the city ordinance allows for, which would be 39 firefighters and then the two chiefs. Um, so we would have three crews of 13 with that. The, the big benefit for the department is that as we do start to experience some of that attrition that I was talking about earlier as members are having to retire uh, or electing to, we'll be able to, uh, through this grant, hire people today, mm -hmm. later this year, we'll, but and then have them potentially with three years of experience um, with the department and learning from those people before they do retire and if the, the need were to exist, that the finances for the city couldn't support 39 firefighters at, at the end of that grant period, it will, uh, we have that avenue that we can pursue if needed to use attrition and reduce the, the number back down to, you know, hopefully 36, not less than 36. Um, so if this grant is approved, it, it, what does it cover? It's three years, all wages, all benefits, pension pickup, everything. Um, for all five positions in over three years, it would be $1.61 million uh, that the city could collect uh, from this FEMA grant. So the, this is a big one. Um, <laughs> well, uh, it's, it's very competitive and I, I don't mean to get anybody's hopes up, um, but we're, we're trying at the very least, you can rest assured of that. We're also continuing our efforts on employee wellness um, last year, uh, through the sale of some of our, uh, an old utility pickup truck that we had and some other uh, stuff, uh, we, we kind of had a little GovDeals garage sale, we can call it, and we were able to raise quite a bit of money that uh, at the time Mayor Montz and City Administrator Thornton had agreed uh, that rather than that money being allocated back into the city's general fund, it could be appropriated through this council to put into the fire department budget for the purchase of workout equipment. Uh, one of the committees that we had established within the department was to put together a, a plan for workout equipment and with the, the original idea being, it'll probably take us two or three years to make all this happen, so don't get too excited, guys. And, uh, but then we, uh, we did pretty good on, on some of the auction items and were able to buy all of the equipment. Um, all in, we were just shy of $40,000 in equipment between the two fire stations uh, within a 12 month period that we were able to purchase. Uh, the, the majority of that went here in, in the, uh, the city hall building 
and it's being used by not just firefighters, but police, the engineer's office. Uh, it's open to all city employees. Um, the the uh, committee that, that we had, I think, did a phenomenal job of uh, specking out that equipment. Um, and I, I want to give thanks to John Souter, who was kind of the, the chairperson, possibly unofficially, but we're going to give him the title, uh, from our department for, for doing that. Um, Along with that, uh, I already talked about the chaplain program that, that we've got back in place. Um, we, after over 20 years of working with Mercy Occupational Health for our annual physicals, have elected to uh, move to a different provider called LifeScan Wellness, that it's actually going to be a three hour physical that they will perform for us. You'll not only meet with a nurse practitioner to review your blood work and all that, but they'll also have the ability to do uh, ultrasounds, uh, looking for uh, cancers that may be growing within each firefighter. Um, and then also uh, you'll meet with an exercise physiologist doing your, your 12 lead and VO max and all those fun things. Um, and then working with you to, if, if you need to lose some weight or increase your flexibility, they, they can give you pointers on all that. Um, NFPA 1582, if you're ever really bored and want to read about the standard for fire department physicals, um, this company checks off all the boxes in there. I'll save you a little bit of time. Um, so we're really excited. This will be our first year using them. They'll be here the first full week of June. And uh, we actually uh, have some of the members from the police department that are going to be included in that as well. They have 45 appointments that they like to fill in the course of the week. And uh, the, the PD was able to have some of their people join in on that as well. Um, so cool stuff there. Uh, this November 18th, we're welcoming in Frank Viscuzzo. Um, he's a retired deputy chief from New Jersey. He's been a keynote, keynote speaker at FDIC, which uh, that's the larger, largest firefighter conference in the world out, out in Indianapolis. Um, he great speaker on leadership. Um, yeah, everything has like a fire department undertone to it, but anybody that wants to learn about leadership and becoming a better person can really take a lot uh, from him. Um, as, as that day gets closer, I'll, I'll definitely be uh, getting information to, to all of you if you wish to attend. Um, then, yeah, uh, the, this, this last one will probably keep me a little busy. Um, we're going to select an architectural firm for a new fire station. So this has been talked about only since about the mid-1960s, uh, about the time that they finished building Station 2. And, um, but the talk had always been about, let's get a third station. And believe me, I, I think three stations suits this town just fine. The problem is our department isn't big enough to staff three stations. And I have no interest in being the fire chief as much as I'm sure the mayor has no interest in being the mayor who has to brown out a station because we don't have enough people to staff three fire stations. So in, in terms of trying to be fiscally responsible and realistic, I think for right now, <coughs> The uh, construction of a new station on the West End, likely, um, and that's one of the things that the architectural firm can assist with, is the actual locating um, of a station. But as we saw with the run volumes in the third ward, it's kind of hard to imagine not having something more towards that end of town. Um, but rather than it being me as the fire chief saying, I want a station in the third ward, let, let's bring in a neutral party that can evaluate uh, the run volumes and, and everything else, and perhaps have a, no predispositions to, to making that call. Um, so we, we've initiated contact with two of them. We've got some meetings coming up over the next couple of weeks to do some preliminary legwork with it. Um, and uh, we'll, we'll just kind of see where, where things go from there. Uh, it is being looked at. Um, the, uh, quite honestly, I'm, I'm thinking since the 1960s, this is the furthest we've ever made it in the process. Um, I, I thank Mayor Dawn for her support of uh, my, my little vision that I have for that and um, allowing me to allocate money into the budget, um, which thank you to all of you for voting in favor of that. Um, because the, 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 this is really, really needed. And I, I don't want to, I could make my a full presentation just on that. We'll save that for another time if you're daring enough to invite me back. <laughs> <laughs> um, so finally, just to say thank you, I um, want to thank the, the mayor, uh, Nick, our new city administrator, 
Uh, it, I would not have imagined that at two and a half years in that I, I can say would have worked for two different mayors and two different <laughs> city administrators already. Um, but I, I've been blessed to have um, the four great people to, to work with in, in that regard. Uh, the members of city council, thank you to, to all of you for your support. Um, you know, dur during these last couple of years and, and bearing with me as I'm learning what I'm doing. Um, the, the department heads uh, that we have in the city, um, they, they are truly amazing people. And um, without any doubt, I, I hope the citizens know that in each instance, the department heads that we have all care about the city very deeply and uh, are truly invested in, in doing the best job that they can uh, for for everybody here in this community. Um, I'm happy to call them friends and uh, uh, co-workers as well. Um, and, and finally, the, the members of the department um, who've uh, supported me, put up with me, whatever you need to say. Um, they, they have been uh, the, the reason that I, I keep coming back and, and wanting to, to do the best job I, I can for them. Uh, so I, I really appreciate each of them as well. So with that, I'd like to open it up for any questions that you might have. Councilman Leopard. Uh, thank you. I have uh, two questions for you. Yes, sir. Uh, Chief. Uh, uh, with the wastewater treatment plant eliminating chlorine from their, uh, from their system, mm -hmm. are we still continuing with chlorine training because of the water company? Uh, not because of the water company any longer. We, we do have periodic trainings that we'll do uh, because there, there's still some chlorine in the area that, that we might deal with, whether it might be the YMCA, the Holiday Inn. Um, they, there's still smaller amounts of it that are concerning, but nothing quite like what uh, the WPCC had before. Mm -hmm. uh, one thing that <laughs> was brought to the attention of City Council quite a few years ago was the proximity of uh, college students and railroad tracks. Uh, any kind of safety system in place for train derailments that may have hazardous uh, chemicals spills? Um, the, in, in terms of uh, any specific plans relating directly to that and the colleges, no. Um, but what we do have is the county uh, plan in place for, for how to handle large scale incidents like that. Um, it, it was just probably three, three and a half years ago that we did have our derailment happen uh, right, right along uh, Miami Street there um, between the Kennedy Bridge and, and Wall Street. Um, that, that was quite a surreal experience walking along the tracks there and uh, seeing all these rail cars literally just thrown around like that. Um, Fortunately, there were no spills. Uh, CSX was on scene remarkably quickly and, and took control of everything. And um, but yeah, if if the need were there to escalate, uh, we'd be relying on the the county plan to start mitigation and any needed evacuations. Um, Tiffin University uh, and and Heidelberg both have the ability to send out messages to their students through text messages. So any emergency notifications needing to be made could be conveyed very quickly uh, so that everybody was aware of what was needed. Thank you. Thank you. Councilman Perry. Thank you. Um, I was wondering if a, um, a business that showed up in your curtain video, if they can expect any kind of royalties. <laughs> um. uh, yeah, so every dollar that we actually make off of this, which I don't think will even be one, dang it, um, dang it. We'll, All right. we'll try and get a percentage out for you. I got you witnesses. But, yeah. Um, well, I just want to say, uh, as we've been going through these reports, how you know lucky we are to have such amazing department heads. And uh, I think we uh, are just very fortunate in Tiffin to have such a great team. I think that just, you know, it just shows that we can grow with uh, such great, you know, leaders uh, in, in the positions that they're in. Um, one question I did have um, was, I, I remember that chart where we have a lot of young people, um, you know, in the department right now. And I was just curious if you had kind of a gauge on how long it takes an officer to get up to kind of full speed where you feel comfortable, um, you know, them being on their own kind of thing. Yeah, so the, the nice thing about our, our staffing model is whether it's uh, the, the aerial, a, a ladder truck, our engine, our, our downtown ambulance, we always have three personnel uh, assigned to that. 
Um, so nobody's ever really completely alone, um, which, which is nice. Um, it allows for uh, the lieutenant assigned to the ambulance to be able to watch and observe uh, a newer member of the department who may be an EMT currently, but going through paramedic school. Um, it, it gives that uh, officer an, an ability to evaluate uh, that student and uh, possibly probationary member still as they're going through that training. But it also allows for the, the younger member of the department to be able to kind of spread their wings and, and fly a little bit, but they still have that safety net there for us as well. Each person's gonna grow and, and mature kind of at their, their own pace, um, but, but we're doing a better job today than what we have before of um, refining our curriculum that we use when, whenever we do bring a new member into the department to ensure that they are knowledgeable uh, in understanding what our expectations are uh, for their skill level and their proficiencies. And we're, we're being able to do a better job of investing time where it needs to be invested in their development. I just thought it was really important <laughs> that, uh, you know, that new agreement we have, you know, I think training uh, people is so expensive and then to have them go elsewhere. Um, so I think it was um, a good agreement uh, that you mentioned before and I'm glad to, to see it got done. So thank you for your presentation. Uh, Chief, I think Council Member Perry needs to flip that thing around. I think we should get royalties for giving him free everything. <laughs> <laughs> uh, this conversation's over. Yeah. <laughs> Based <hungry>. on you. <laughs> <laughs> Any other questions? All right, well, if there's no other questions then, and only because Chief Polly made me do this, in effect, I have to ask for applause. <laughs> <laughs> With that, I'm done, so thank you very much. I appreciate everybody's time and attention and questions. Thank you. Thank you, Chief, for coming in. Okay, I, kn I know it's going a little long. I will speak quickly like I usually do. So for updates, uh, with a recent resignation on the Seneca County Health Board, I have had to make another appointment. I received four letters of interest in tonight's council packet. You will see that I have selected Tiffin resident John Bing. I have worked with him off and on over the years on various committees and feel he will be a great addition to their board moving forward. Road closures and delays continue around the city with projects going on now with several utilities. Please be patient. It's going to be a long summer. City Hall offices will be closed on Good Friday, April 7th. And upcoming events in April before our next meeting. For the Parks Department, I'd like to plug a few things again coming up this month, April 5th, which the Chief mentioned, which is Wednesday, day camp signups online begin. April 15th at 9 a.m. will be the annual Oakley Park Cleanup Day. They are also in need of lifeguards and other positions we filled this summer. And Public Works also mentioned that they need two seasonal workers, so if anyone's interested. I will be participating in a podcast, United She Stands, on April 11th on the novelty of being a woman mayor in the state of Ohio. The Tree Commission Academy resumes training on April 13th and 14th out at the NCO ESC with the sophomore class. I will be participating along with several members from our Public Works Department. And Council Member Jones, will you be there also? Correct. So yes. Council Member Jones will be joining us. On Saturday, April 15th, I will be out at Hedges Boyer Park along with the group from Cycling Without Age Seneca County to read a proclamation to kick off their Wind in Your Hair 5K Fun Run and Walk Day. They are also looking for volunteers and pilots as they call the people driving the trishaws. So if anybody's interested, they could use some pilots. And so that concludes my report. Thank you. Um, any questions from the mayor? Yes. Yes. Oh, oh, sorry. Sorry, I was looking that oh, way. Sorry. <laughs> yeah. Uh, what was the date again on the Oakley Park cleanup? April 15th. 15th, okay. Yep, April 15th, 9 a.m. Yep. 9 a.m. Thank you. Mayor would know they're closing the block for four hours Thursday morning. I saw a sign downtown. Front Which of, block? Front of the courthouse. I guess. It said the whole entire block is closed for four hours. There's a sign there, yeah. I just figured you would know. So okay. Yes, uh, they're removing the snowflakes that are uh, up in downtown. So that is the, the removing of the snowflakes that's going on during that time. Okay. Oh, you mean park? I'm sorry. I thought you meant the roads were closed. No, I knew about the parking. I, I misunderstood how you asked that. Sorry. I asked. 
the whole entire block, there's a sign downtown. Correct. The whole block the is parking. closed? It, so the at, they'll be going down the, the block as they go. We just wanted to make sure the vehicles were out of the way so we could get those removed okay. and that placed sense. on trucks. Any other questions for the mayor? Yes, Councilman Perry. Another question. Um, about that advertising? Yeah. Yeah, no, no. <laughs> um, just about the appointment of the Board of Health. Just curious on your, I don't know if we want to discuss it now or if we want to send it to committee, but I'd rather, just a brief, uh, what made you choose uh, Mr. Bing? Um, like, like I said, he, he sent a very thorough resume and I have worked with him off and on over the years and I just thought he would be a good fit for this time and what they need out there. Okay. Any other questions? Yep. Do you have anything else? Um, no, just uh, my only thing is uh, just reading through everything that Mr. Bing um, obviously has a very good resume. Um, I just don't know if it suits him for the Board of Health. Um, I know he's got a lot of experience and I know he said his dad, um, you know, as a biochemist and stuff. <laughs> That I get. Um, well, remember, they, they don't want another doctor. <laughs> right, right. But, I mean, we use that for a justification on the last one. So I just honestly just, uh, you know, thinking it through in my head, just seeing why you thought, you know, pick the one that you picked. So. Any other questions for the mayor? Okay, thank you. Um, we are now under Clerk of Council and Forest. No report. Thank Madam you. President. Director of Finance, Kathy Kaufman. No report, Madam President. Thank you. And Director of Law, Brent T. Howard. Yes, thank you. Just one item, um, give you an update. Um, the city uh, administration is meeting with the developer of the uh, Tiffin Riverfront Development Project this week. Uh, we haven't heard much about that uh, publicly. Uh, the city will be uh, discussing the, the status of the project, in particular the uh, status of the uh, financing that the developer is trying to obtain. And then also we're going to continue the discussions, negotiations uh, regarding the developer's contribution towards the parking lot uh, because the parking lot is going to be uh, impacted by the project. Also the river wall in that area is going to be impacted. And uh, we had made proposals regarding contribution in return for the TIF uh, consideration, which you have uh, approved. Um, so we'll find out uh, kind of what progress we can make. Um, I mentioned before that eventually this will come back to city council for legislation. You will have to, and they, um, um, you can withhold it if you're not satisfied. So we're working to get uh, what we believe is the administration believes um, their um, appropriate contribution given the, the effect that they will have in those areas. So um, I'll report back in the next uh, future meetings. I can't give you an exact time frame. We'll know a lot more this week after we, we have our meeting. Um, but there will be uh, specific legislation that will be uh, presented to you with detailed explanation of, um, of the TIF consideration. Any questions regarding that matter or really anything else that you might have for me? Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Um, okay, we are now under written communications. <clears throat> thank you. Mayor's request for legislation number 23-22, appointment to Seneca County Board of Health of John Bing. Mayor's request for legislation, <clears throat> excuse me, number 23-22 will be forwarded to the Personnel and Labor Relations Committee. Mayor's request for legislation number 23-23, ODOT resurfacing. Mayor's request for legislation number 23-23 will be referred to the Street Sidewalks and Sewers Committee. Sorry. Finance Director's request for legislation number F23-8 to amend the 2023 Budget Ordinance 22-108 to appropriate funds into the Street and Sewer Maintenance Department budgets. Finance Director's request for legislation number F23-8 has been prepared uh, in tonight's meeting agenda as Ordinance 23-24, if I can read my handwriting. And also attached are the letters of interest in the Seneca County Board of Health vacancy of John Bing, Kimberly Carpenter, Matt Wolf, and Mary Franks. Um, thank you. These will be held on file in the clerk's office. 
And that concludes the written communications. Thank you. We are now under oral communications. Anyone wishing to address council may step to the podium, sign in, and direct their questions to myself. Good evening. I'm David Kale. I am chairman of the Board of Elections. I am former chairman of the Republican Party of Seneca County and appointee of the Secretary of State, but I'll make the same disclaimer I made two weeks ago. I am not speaking on their behalf. Any remarks I have are entirely my own and not on behalf of the other board members. Um, I will keep my remarks briefer than I was last time. <laughs> um, I sent you all an email after the previous meeting with the full text of any documents I referenced um, and some other remarks. I'm not going to rehash all of that tonight, but if you have any questions, I'm willing to take them either here as a group or individually. And I consider that email to be public record, so if any voters ask you anything about it, you can forward it to them. You have my permission to forward that to anyone. And the Advertiser Tribune has it as well. Um, basically, I just have a couple of remarks tonight about your committee, the whole meeting a couple hours ago now. Um, your, that's why I don't want to keep you too long. <laughs> but um, you apparently are interested in doing a separate instruction sheet for petitions separate from what the Board of Elections hands out to all other candidates for all other offices. It is already on our agenda. The Board of Elections has a meeting April 12th. I believe it's at 3 p.m. Uh, reviewing that instruction sheet is already on the agenda. I have been on the board for over eight years, and we have not changed it at any point in there, so we're going to take another look at it because this is the first time it's really come up as something that uh, has concerned an unusually large number of people, so it's already on there. I would, I don't have the, don't have it in front of me, but I believe one of the instructions is that for partisan offices, you need to get signatures from only members of the same party. That's something you need to take out if you keep Article 10, because as the director of law said, you can get signatures from any member of any party or any independents for any city office. So even if you're running with a party label on the ballot, some candidates are, some candidates are not, they can get signatures from any member of any party under Article 10 for Tiffin city offices. That's not true for any other petitions for any partisan offices. So if that's on the instruction sheet, and like I said, I don't have it in front of me, but I'm about 99% sure it's on there. You're going to have to take that out. Uh, the other remarks I would have. Um, that doesn't apply. Having a meeting on May 1st with the Board of Elections. I can personally be here. I think the other three board members would probably be here. However, that's the night before the election. And our two directors are extremely busy. They have been working at that point for a minimum of 10 days straight. The two directors are working about 60 hours a week in the weeks before the election, and they have to be at the office at 5.30 in the morning on May 2nd. So I would expect that the two directors, one of whom, our new director, Lori Ritzler, is a member, former member of council, I would not expect them to be here on May 1st. So yeah, before I or think after if, if I can interrupt better. you, David, sorry. I, I think given, um, the fact that the Board of Elections is meeting on this in a couple weeks um, about the exact document that we were looking to take away, review, and kind of almost, so to speak, red line, and then regroup on May 1st, it, it probably doesn't make sense for us to continue to hold that meeting until we see what changes you guys are looking to make. Um, and, and from there, then, once you guys have your proposed changes, we could, if, you know, with your permission, review those, and then take into consideration if there's anything else we would like to add or modify, provide clarity to whatever it may be. That's my opinion. Um, obviously, it's also up to council, but I don't know that it makes much sense for us to continue to hold that meeting. And I also don't know what you guys are thinking as far as timing, as far as what your process you, you believe would, how long that would take in order for you guys to kind of come to an a, alignment between you guys of um, your modifications of the instruction sheet. We have not had a meeting since the meetings that we had a very large <laughs> audience at. Um, we don't have a regular meeting date. Our meeting dates are determined by the election calendar. 
So in January, we don't normally meet at all. In May, we normally meet three or four times okay. because of the, the election calendar. But we have not had a meeting since the petitions meeting we had. Um, you are obviously you're welcome to come to our meetings. We don't normally have any audience at all. <laughs> sure. But you're all welcome. And I, I think I can probably speak on the behalf of the other three board members. I suspect they would all be willing to have a joint meeting with you. Okay. I would be surprised if, I mean, we have a brand new board member who has not actually attended a meeting yet as an official board member, but I would be surprised if any of the other three board members would reject having a joint <coughs> meeting. It's just, we would like to have our two directors there at the time, and May 1st would be extremely difficult for it. For the sure. Directors. No, that makes sense. Um, I, I think it probably would make sense, again, this is my opinion, but happy to open it up to the group, but it would also probably make sense for you guys to have your own meeting you discuss amongst yourselves of what you believe, again, would be the modifications, in my opinion. And then we could take a look at that individually and regroup as a group, um, maybe with you guys that and at that, that time have a joint, um, you know, discussion. But um, I understand that the golf cart meeting is not going to be April 17th, that it's going to street sidewalks and sewers instead? No, it's um, it's staying with street sidewalks and sewers committee, but I, I misunderstood. It's okay. It's at 6 p.m. on April 17th. Okay. Yep. Don't want to. So I confuse that with the committee of the whole meeting. But okay. yeah. I don't yeah. want to make it any longer for you. <laughs> I appreciate it. Um, I would uh, like to point one, out one other thing in particular. Um, there is no Democratic ballot anywhere in the county on May 2nd. And a lot of people are going to be surprised by that. A lot of people are going to be upset by that. The uh, director, <clears throat> the county's director of communications, Jimmy Flint, has already sent out a press release about that. He intends to do that again. He has already, he intends to put it again on our Facebook page and other things. But uh, one of our other board members, Nancy Grandillo, and I are currently working on a letter that we will be sending to the Advertiser Tribune to explain that because we've got three different situations, the townships, Tiffin, and Fostoria. Fostoria has its own election system too. But um, I do want to point out that if you're in the townships or the villages, you have a choice of a Republican ballot or nothing. The Republican ballot will have the two Republican candidates for municipal court judge. The voters who are not Republican <clears throat> do not get to vote in that race. The Democrat who is running for municipal court judge goes automatically to the November ballot without a primary because he's unopposed. So anyone in the villages and townships gets a Republican ballot or nothing. In Tiffin, it's different because of Article 10. You can get a Republican ballot that will have the city mayor's race and the judge's race. And so all three names running for mayor will be on the Republican ballot because it's your open primary system. If you are a Democrat or independent and you want to vote in Tiffin, then you will get a nonpartisan ballot, which will have the three candidates for mayor, but not the judge's candidates. And so a Democrat voting in Tiffin or an independent voting in Tiffin on May 2nd will get that nonpartisan ballot and we'll see two Republican names, Mary Franks and John Spark, and the Democrat, excuse me, he's not running as a Democrat. Lee Wilkinson is a registered Democrat, but he did not put down a party name. So in effect, because of Article 10, the Democrats will get to choose which Republican goes on to the ballot in November, right. which is one of my concerns about Article 10. Um, Lauder, are you yeah, on that point, I guess I, I think the message that the that really expresses what we have in terms of a nom nominating process is that not that there's not a Democratic uh, um, primary or ballot, is that all voters in the city of Tiffin have the ability to vote in the open primary for the mayor's race. Yes. And so all voters should try to attend their, their, uh, and vote um, during this open primary that the city has. We want everyone That's to the vote. message, really, that the voters should all have, that there's an opportunity for them to vote in the 
nominating process for the mayor's race, regardless of party affiliation? Actually, the, the letter that Nancy and I have been going back and forth on today, I added that sentence basically at the end that we want everyone to vote. We want a high voter turnout, and we want everyone to come out and vote, even though there's not going to be very much on the ballot. We unfortunately had the August election last year, which had a 6% turnout, which is just incredibly frustrating to me. Um, countries around the world routinely have 70 or 80% turnout. Australia routinely has 90% turnout. We consider it a great turnout. We have 55%. We had 6%. David, if we could also go back, because I didn't um, allow the council members to weigh in on the, um, the process of the instructions sheet and the meeting on May 1st that, again, in my opinion, I don't know if it makes much sense to continue that at that time. I think maybe we, we might need to push that based upon scheduling, but also seeing what comes back from the Board of Elections. Um, so, uh, Council Member Thacker, yes. I would be in favor of moving it to the second regular meeting. In May. In May. So that, that it gives them time to do what they need to do. I think it's better if we have more people involved, if we have more people from their board and their directors being involved. And with the elections, it, I think it's going to be a time restraint. Councilman Spar. I have a question uh, regarding that list, the, the not the rules, but the checkoff list that you guys were talking about discussing at your next board meeting. Would there be, do you think there would be a decision made on that and you'd be able to present something or be able to send something over to council? Or is this an ongoing, I, will this be an ongoing dis, uh, uh, conversation at the Board of Elections? I think we just have it on the agenda for review. I don't think there's any specific vote schedule. Okay. <clears throat> yeah, that's, so that's that, kind of what I was asking earlier. Exactly, it was like, yeah. what, how long do we feel that process is going to take for then us to see something and be able to review it based upon your guys' feedback input? Or maybe you don't make any modifications, <laughs> but um, hopefully not. But yeah, that's exactly what I was asking as well. Um, Council Member Thacker, sorry. I um, am of the opinion that I don't want any potential inaction on somebody else's part stop us from doing what we need to do. And so I think either way, we should revisit this in May, uh, whether or not they've decided to change their sheet. Yeah. You could actually come on election night. For election day, May 2nd, the board convenes at 6.30 in the morning to officially open the polls. We then recess. We are required to be able to reconvene within 20 minutes if there's some court order or secretary of state order or something. Uh, so we can't be out of the county, but we're required to be there within 20 minutes if there's an emergency. Normally, we reconvene approximately 7.20. We then officially close the polls at 7.30. And then basically, the board members kind of sit there until the, all the precinct election officials come in. There's audience there. Uh, we live stream our election night meetings. I believe we are the only county in the state that live streams our election meetings. <coughs> but there's an audience there usually of candidates waiting to come in, candidate supporters. But we could easily, on May 2nd, discuss things with you because we basically are sitting there for two hours until the computer guy and all the precinct election officials come in. So. It might be more difficult for the directors to do that also because the directors are in and out of the back room and Yeah, I think it. it's probably going to make the most sense, again, in my opinion, but anybody can disagree. But that to keep the May 17th meeting, maybe That's probably we'll push idea. that to the Committee of the Whole um, at 6 p.m. if that works still for everybody as far as timing and then obviously extend the invite, um, you know, to you, to you four, I believe, correct? Four of us, yes. Um, uh, to ensure that you can attend or at least a few of you that would be really helpful to just hear our discussion and if you guys have any input. Um, I can't commit to them, but I would anticipate sure. that all four of us would be here. Okay. Council Member Leopard. So um, our charter situation, we're going to meet on May 15th at 6 p.m., not the 1st. Right. I think it's the 17th. 
Or I'm sorry, it's the 15th. 15th. I'm looking at 15th, April. So Wednesday. 15th. Yes. May 15th, 15th, 6 p.m. Yes. Okay. Thank you. We do have the official count. I don't have the date in front of me. I believe our official count is May 17th. But if it's May 15th, then we could not be here. We must be there for the official count. But I'm, it depends on when the computer guy can do it. And okay. I, off the top of my head, I believe it is May 17th. So okay. there should be no problem. May 15th meeting should be fine. Awesome. Okay. Thank you very much. Okay. Yeah, let us know if it's otherwise. All right. Thank you. Appreciate Thank you. it, David. All right. Okay. So do you have that? Do you want me to re-announce that at the end? Okay. Okay. I will do that. Yep. Okay. Um, anyone else wishing to address council this evening? Okay. Uh, we are now under motions. Are there any motions this evening? Okay. Seeing none, we are now under resolutions and ordinances. <clears throat> Resolution number 23-15, introduced by Steve Leopard. Resolution <clears throat> accepting the recommendation of the Tax Incentive Review Council to continue certain tax incentive agreements with local businesses and property owners and declaring an emergency. This is the second reading of resolution 23-15. Resolution number 23-16 introduced by Steve Le Leppard. Excuse me. Resolution approving and adopting the City of Tiffin's Americans with Disabilities Act ADA transition plan. This is the first reading of resolution 23-16. Ordinance number 23-14, introduced by Daniel Perry. Ordinance amending chapter 142 of Tiffin codified ordinances, removing, and removing the alarm system permit and city monitoring provisions. This is the third reading of ordinance 23-14. Council member Perry. Yeah, thank you. I'd like to ask for passage of ordinance 23-14. Thank you. There is a motion for a passage of ordinance 23-14. <clears throat> is there a second? Council member Thacker. I'll second that motion. Thank you. There's a motion and a second. Is there any discussion? Okay, seeing none, we will vote on the passage. Councilmember Perry? Yes. Reesner? Yes. Spar? Yes. Thacker? Yes. Wilkins? Yes. Jones? Yes. And Leopard? Yes. Ordinance 23 14 passes with a vote of 7 to 0. Ordinance number 23 15 introduced by Daniel Perry. Ordinance amending Chapter 143 of the Tiffin Codified Ordinances, revising certification requirements. Residency requirements for newly appointed firefighters and age limits for original appointment of employees in the fire rescue division, adding gender neutral language and declaring an emergency. This is the third reading of Ordinance 23 15. Councilmember Perry. Yeah, thank you. I'd like to ask for passage of Ordinance 23 15. Thank you. There's a motion for passage of Ordinance 23 15. Is there a second? Councilmember Spar. Yes, I'll second that motion. <clears throat> Thank, you. Thank you. There is a motion and a second. Is there any discussion? Okay, seeing none, we'll first vote on the emergency. Council Member Perry? Yes. Reesner? Yes. Spar? Yes. Thacker? Yes. Wilkins? Yes. Jones? Yes. Leopard? Yes. Emergency passed with a vote of 7 to 0. We will now vote on the passage. Council Member Perry? Yes. Reesner? Yes. Spar? Yes. Thacker? Yes. Wilkins? Yes. Jones? Yes. And Leopard? Yes. Ordinance 23-15 passes with a vote of 7-0. Ordinance number 23-16, introduced by Cheyenne Thacker. Ordinance authorizing the mayor to accept easements and, and licenses for sanitary sewer purposes for the Home Sewage Treatment System, HSTS, elimination project and declaring an emergency. This is the second reading of Ordinance 23-16. Ordinance number 23-17, introduced by Cheyenne Thacker. Ordinance authorizing the mayor to accept permanent easements from RNL Zeiss Family Partnership 3 Limited for sanitary and storm sewer purposes in the Fairview Hill condominium development on Euclid Avenue in the third ward of the city and declaring an emergency. This is the second reading of Ordinance 23-17. <clears throat> Ordinance number 23-18, Introduced by Cheyenne Thacker, ordinance authorizing city administrator to prepare plans and specifications, advertise for and receive bids, and recommend and execute a contract for the home sewage treatment system, HSTS elimination project, 
amending the budget for the expense of the contract and declaring an emergency. This is the second reading of ordinance 23-18. Ordinance number 23-23 introduced by Kevin Reisner. Ordinance authorizing all actions necessary to accept Northeast Ohio Public Energy Council NOPEC 2023 energized community grant and declaring an emergency. This is the first reading of ordinance 23-23. Ordinance number 23-24 introduced by Kevin Reisner. Ordinance amending 2023 budget ordinance 22-108 to appropriate $55,749 into the street and sewer maintenance department budgets from a grant received from NOPEC. This is the first reading of ordinance 23-24. That concludes the ordinances. Thank you. Um, we are now under other business. At this time, I would like to modify the committee of the whole meeting announcement made earlier uh, this meeting. Um, we, will, we will no longer be uh, having that meeting on May 1st at 6 p.m. It will be pushed to May 15th at 6 p.m. in council chambers uh, to continue discussions regarding the uh, city council candidate position and any other business to come before council. Councilmember Thacker. Uh, yes, I'd like to announce a streets, sidewalks, and sewers committee meeting on April 17th at 6 p.m. Uh, this is to discuss uh, both our previous discussion on golf carts and utility vehicles and also mayor's request for legislation. Let me find it. 23-23 and any other business that comes before that committee. Thank you. Um, any other business to come before council this evening? Council member Perry, are you scheduling your meeting or are you holding off for now? Um, hold off for now. Um, just need to a check with my wife's schedule. <laughs> Because uh, she uh, had to schedule for nursing today, um, but yes, I will. Um, okay. I will reach out to my community members. Great. Awesome. Anything else to come before council? Okay. Well, thank you all very much. I know it was a long meeting, so appreciate everybody's time this evening. Enjoy the basketball game. Yeah. Set on time. Does